The Overwatch Cooler Master Invitational is this weekend, giving 12 high school robotics teams their shot at a $40,000 prize pool that benefits their school. It will be live streamed, so check the link in the description to check it out and help Cooler Master support STEM education programs. Excellent! What's up guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. This is Probing Paul, my monthly Q&A video where I answer questions that you guys have proposed to me and the questions typically come from last month's video. This is uh, episode number 17, by the way. And last month was episode number 16, uh, and there you can see the long history of Probing Paul's. Now, also, as I'm showing you guys last month's video, I'm going to segue right into the first uh, question for this month's video, or a bit of a response, because last month the, the first question that I answered was this one right here about what the best CPU and graphics card setup would be for a family room 65-inch 4K TV build, which I responded to and I said uh, X299 and an Intel 7740X, one of their new quad-core CPUs, which haven't been very well received. And uh, speaking of not being very well received, oh my god, did I get some negative flack for that recommendation. So uh, here, here's just like, just a, a small sampling of that. I could have kept going further, but um, uh, people calling me shill, and it's the most BS ever, and uh, really bad recommendation, people disliking the video and all that kind of stuff, which, you know, I'm gonna cop to, like, uh, totally warranted to some extent. I mean, it really depends on how you look at that original question. Uh, he was asking for what the best was, and uh, the best at the time, or previous to uh, Skylake X and KB Lake X launching, would be a 7700K when it comes to all-around GPU performance for a CPU. You're never going to get more performance out of a graphics card than you will with a 7700K at whatever re resolution you happen to be playing at. Now you could say, yeah, when you're playing at 4K, it doesn't really matter. The the, the load goes over to the C or the GPU rather than the CPU, uh, and that's certainly viable as well. From my perspective, I was really looking at this as answering the question, what is the best possible CPU and GPU configuration that I can get? What will get the most out of that GPU in any situation? And I was like, well, if a 7700K is the best, then what's coming out right now is a 7740K, which can overclock to 5.1 to 5.2 gigahertz, whereas the 7700K would usually top out at maybe 4.8 to 5. A little bit higher frequency should give you just slightly more GPU performance in games that are otherwise CPU bottlenecked. So that's why I recommended it. It was a completely out there recommendation, only for a very specific niche scenario. And uh, again, I understand any of you guys who were slightly disappointed with that recommendation, especially now that it's a month later and there's a little bit more information that has come out. There's been a ton more testing that has gone on with both the KB Lake X and Skylake X CPUs in the past month. And I wanna really quickly highlight uh, Hardware Unboxed because uh, I managed to get the, a chance to meet Steve in person. That's a, probably a poor, uh, screen cap of Steve there, but got to meet him in person at Computex. He's a really nice guy, and they do really good testing over there, and I will fully admit that they've done way more and way better testing than I have uh, in the past month for sure. And if anyone's calling me shill, just like look at my coverage of this X299 launch, compare it to say the X99 launch and how many videos I did for that, and you can probably get <laughs> at least some idea of the fact that I've I've been less enthused about this platform as well. Now if you jump up to actual um, gaming performance here, he is showing, um, and these are stock benchmarks by the, by the way, not including overclocking, but the 7700K when it comes to pure gaming, he is testing at 1080 as well by the way, um, still seems to beat the 7740K in a lot of situations. He also just recently tested the 7800X testing 6-core Skylake X versus the 7700K. So I'll put links to both of these in the description if you guys want to check them out. 7700K continues to win in case you are wondering. So all of this is to say uh, that my decision right now to recommend that CPU was probably not the best one. Certainly not the best price to performance, but that's really not what I was going for. But now that we're seeing that the 7700K is even outperforming it in some situations, uh, it makes it even less of a viable uh, uh, option if it was a viable option to begin with at all in the first place. So yeah, if you guys want my honest opinion about recommendations for gaming PCs and otherwise, uh, the next few questions should hopefully set you straight as far as what I'm actually recommending when it comes to a more well-rounded question like what's the best bang for your buck? What's the best all-around solution to this? Not just 
What's the fastest thing that I can possibly get? Let's move into some questions for this week, though. First one from WM1989. Hey, Paul, looking to build a rather unique and specific machine. Goals are a 4K TV and, me TV and media center, home network NAS, and remote processing server. Looking for a system I can log on to remotely and run all sorts of in memory using CPU and CUDA, analysis in Python, or even Excel. So clock speed and multi-threaded performance both matter. Do you think the 7900K will fit the bill or am I completely off base? Am I missing something less obvious that could bottleneck these types of tasks? Well, when you talk about bottlenecking a task that is extremely CPU intensive, uh, like Python analysis or uh, the really heavy calculation, heavy Excel work, um, basically it's gonna use as many cores, as many threads as possible. It's gonna max out what the CPU is capable of. So bottleneck isn't exactly the word, but you'll be able to make use of whatever you put in there, I guess would be better a better way to put that. That said, the 7900K costs a thousand bucks, motherboards cost 250 bucks and up, and that's gonna be a very expensive platform to get into. I think a Ryzen system would be a great solution for you right here. I would recommend the Ryzen 7 1700. That's gonna give you the most cores and the most threads for the least amount of money on that platform. You can overclock it and get performance that's right in line with a 1700X or 1800X. And your motherboards are gonna cost, you know, 150 to 200 bucks, even less than that if you go B350, uh, rather than the premium you have to pay uh, to get into the uh, LGA 2066 platform that Intel currently has going with the X299 chipset. Now you should also hang out for just a few minutes, just a couple weeks probably, uh, and take a look at what AMD does have in line for Threadripper because they've just announced some more information about that. This article is also linked in the description. They've also announced pricing. So Threadripper is coming. They announced two models, a 32 thread 16 core version. It's going to be a thousand dollars. So compare that at a thousand bucks to the 12 core, uh, the, sorry, the 10 core 20 thread. Uh, 7900X, and then for 800 bucks, uh, you get a 12 core 24 thread version of that. And they said that they are going to be shipping CPUs and motherboards in early August. Uh, you can even do pre orders starting on July 27th. So that's pretty soon. And for your type of work, that might be something to take a look at. That said, again, if you want bang for your buck, uh, I would say a Ryzen 7 1700 would be, would be a great option for you. It will do all those things you want it to do, uh, and, it, and it will do them well. Next question from Parth Meta. Another another build question. I'm, it's like I'm trying to redeem myself from last month or something. I'm trying to build a streaming content creation and gaming build for my processor. Should I go with the Ryzen 1700X or an i7-7740X? Should I get a 4K 60Hz monitor uh, or 1440p 144Hz monitor? Well, uh, Parth, I apologize if you were misled at all by last month's video, if that's what you happen to watch. But for your purposes, especially if you're going to be streaming and doing content creation, absolutely the Ryzen 1700X is what you should go for. Even the 1700, uh, you, as long as you're okay with overclocking it, would be a good option as well. Uh, and then as far as your monitor, I'd say a 144 hertz panel. Um, if gaming is your thing, you're going to appreciate that higher refresh rate. Uh, and 1440 is a lot easier to push uh, with with uh, a, a more reasonably priced GPU, so you won't necessarily have to get like a 1080 Ti or something like that to get yourself up and running with that. So those would be my recommendations for you. Uh, another build question. Wow. All right, this is the last one. Uh, learning. Uh, he's learning 3D modeling in Blender. He's going to need a PC based on a Ryzen 7 1700. Should I buy the 1700 now or wait for AMD Threadripper? My budget on the CPU is $350. Um, well, I hope Yar Yaroslav Zinchenko, by the way, asked this question. Uh, he said he also plays computer games. He decided not to get with the, the Intel Core i7 because 16 threads are awesome compared and, and rendering, and you're absolutely right there. So for sure, 1700 is a great way to go, and if you were already watching the rest of this video, you saw some of those initial prices for Threadripper. They are pretty high. It's a high-end platform. It's going to be costly. That's that's kind of the way it goes. Uh, if it's still putting the screws to Intel, even costing that much money, I'd say it's in a good position. But since you're saying your CPU budget is 350 bucks, uh, just go with Ryzen for right now. For that much money, you still still can get an 8-core, 16-thread processor. They're still really beastly, especially if you're doing something like Blender, something that can uh, take advantage of all those threads. So go for it. Uh, look, look, I just did three Ryzen recommendations in a row. I'm not, I'm not in... I'm not an Intel shill. All right, uh, buy a GTX 1080 now or wait for Vega, asks Saeed Islam. Uh, he's upgrading an aging 780 Ti. Uh, here again, I would say wait for Vega and that's just because it's only about two months off. It's still a big question. 
what kind of competition Vega is going to have for the 1080. When it actually comes to gaming, it looks like Vega is going to be not quite as powerful as people were hoping it would be, but we still don't know absolutely for sure. Everything right now is mostly based on the Vega Frontier Edition stuff that's come out, um, which isn't necessarily your gaming specific card. Um, so yeah, I just say waits. Uh, it should be coming out at about the same time frame as that Threadripper stuff that we talked about. So end of July, very beginning of August, uh, SIGGRAPH at that event is when AMD is going to be having some additional un announcements about those products. Next question though from Padawan Preacher. For folks like myself who are just now possibly getting into video editing, what rendering or export settings do you use to get a manageable file, final file size at 1080p while not sacrificing on production quality? What matters and what doesn't? Well, there's a lot of stuff that goes into this as far as what resolution and uh, bitrate and everything that you're recording at. I will just focus on the main thing that you asked, which is gonna be about exporting. So uh, here's Adobe Premiere CC. This is uh, the Arctic Panther 2 teaser project that I did just recently. And whenever I go to exports, uh, oh wait, I gotta be choosing that window first. So whenever I go to export my media, here's here's how I kind of run down stuff. I basically have three, uh, two resolutions that I might do, 1920 by 1080 or 4K, 3840 by uh, 2160. I will usually save presets for them so I can grab them from the drop down menu here. I usually do H.264, although I will probably be switching to HEVC H.265 at some point soon, but YouTube uh, processes H.264 really well. Uh, they have for quite some time now. Hey, stop it. Uh, so once I've chosen the format up here, I just run down things here. So if it's a 4K video, 4K resolution, put that in right there. Frame rate, uh, I usually do, if I'm recording 24, frames per second at 4K, which I do pretty frequently with 4K, I'll just render it out at 4K. If I'm doing 1920 by 1080, I usually do 60 frames per second. Um, for beyond that, I just do progressive scan, of course, always, square pixels, NTSC. If you're in uh, Europe or whatever, you can do, uh, I'm sorry, Europe and Asia, you can do PAL. Uh, profile's main level will change depending on uh, the, the resolution you do. need to do a higher level if you go with the higher resolution like 4K. And then bitrate down here. I usually just do a single pass variable bitrate and I target 42 megabits per second for 4K. If I'm doing 1080 60 frames per second, I usually bring the bitrate down to about 25. And then for regular 1080 30 stuff, I'm usually fine at about 15. And that's pretty much what I where, where I go to. Uh, for 4K again, I was doing between 40 and 45. I was doing 45 for a while and then Actually, I saw Jay say he does 40, and then I started doing, so I chose 42. It's right in the middle. Uh, I also usually choose ma uh, maximum render quality, and that usually gets me uh, really good quality that, uh, that still looks pretty good after YouTube has processed it. But if you want that high quality, uh, it's, it's, it's just going to take up a little bit more space, chances are. All right, Bird Bamboo asks, Hey, Paul, I'm planning on adding a 360 red to the front of my case and buying some static pressure fans. Should I use the static pressure fans along with my stock fans, the ones in the build or the ones I assume that came with the case, in a push-pull configuration? If so, where should the stock fans go and where should the static pressure fans go? Uh, so two parts to this. One is should you use both of them? It's a difficult question to ask without knowing specifically the specs of the fans that you're planning to use. Static pressure fans, um, you know, those are the ones that are, are ideally meant to go right up against the radiators, radiator, so obviously you're fine with those. I would say try with and without adding your additional, adding your, your other fans, um, but definitely uh, if the 360 is an intake, put the static pressure fans on the intake side, so the uh, air, fans, radiator, and then the rest of your system, and then try uh, the existing fans on the inside of that radiator and push pull. See what kind of change it makes. Chances are it might help a little bit, but um, once you test how much power it's drawing, how much additional noise it might make with those fans, it may or may not actually be worth it for you. But uh, definitely use the static pressure fans as your intake, uh, so they'll be pushing right up against that radiator because that's where most of the uh, difficulty for air passing through is, and that's where you want the static pressure fans to be doing the most. One last question from Virusware. Beacon or sausage? I assume this means bacon or sausage, unless he was talking about a grail-shaped beacon, but uh, a, a very, very challenging question, um, an eternal question, actually. I'd probably have to go with bacon, uh, especially if it's well done. It's got to be nice and crispy, um, but I mean, that's so challenging because sausage covers such a wide variety of, of, of blended and spiced meats shoved into uh, entrails or, or whatever uh, they're actually packed in, and those are really good, too. I mean... Honestly, they're really, really close for me. But I mean, if it if if I gotta choose one, I gotta go with some crispy 
some crispy, crispy bacon. And guys, that's pretty much all I have for the July episode of Probing Paul. Thank you so much for watching. I hope it has been at least somewhat enlightening for you guys. Uh, of course, if you want to ask me questions for next month, leave those questions in the comment section down below, and I will eventually get to scrolling through those and answer them in August's episode of Probing Paul. Thank you so much for watching. As always, hit the thumbs up button on your way out if you enjoyed it, and we'll see you guys in the next video.